Good morning, everybody. So today uh, we are talking about scaling a business on the Byte platform. So this is basically going from operating a single kiosk or zero kiosk to operating multiple kiosks across uh, many locations. Um, before we jump into a few slides, I wanted to introduce ourselves, you know, who the heck is talking and why you should listen to us uh, or why we have something to share. So um, Elise, why don't you kick us off? Hi, everybody. Good morning. Uh, I'm Elise Diamond, and I'm the Director of Client Success here with Byte. Um, I've been with the organization since 2018, running the full service business, and then moved over to licensing and helping operators do the same thing we did successfully here in the Bay Area. Um, and I'm based in Sonoma County in wine country. Excellent. So, and Elise has interfaced with hundreds of clients at this point, all kinds of different business models, food service operators, vending operators, entrepreneurs just getting started, retailers, restaurants, you name it. Um, so she has a wealth of knowledge. I'm Megan Mokri. I'm one of the founders and the CEO of Byte. Um, and, and for context as background, when Byte first started in the early days, we actually operated the service ourselves. That's what Elise was referencing. We had um, uh, over 500 kiosks across the San Francisco Bay Area in um, all kinds of locations. So workplaces, hospitals, um, apartment buildings. We were in uh, San Quentin prison. We were in nonprofits, um, universities, really anywhere you could imagine someone wanting to get a fresh meal on the go, you would find a kiosk. So um, hopefully we're speaking from experience in terms of some of the tips and tricks that we're going to share today. Um, so without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into a short deck that we're going to walk through. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so operating for growth. Overarching agenda, we're going to talk about a few key things, um, and there's many, but we're going to distill it down to just four today on what to think about as you are starting to scale your fleet of bike kiosks. Um, first is product selection. How do you think about what actually goes into the fridge itself? Second is merchandising, really how that product that you have is displayed to make it you know, visually intriguing and, and also very profitable for your business. The third uh, is routing. So if you are going to multiple locations at different addresses, you have to think about routing and um, the time of when you actually restock those kiosks. Um, and then the last piece is financial optimization. So how do you uh, retroactively look at the financial performance of these kiosks and then make little tweaks here and there to ultimately boost your margin over time? But first, let's do a quick poll because we want this to be relevant to you. Uh, Bytes kiosks are used in a plethora of ways. Uh, let's first get a sense of who is here. So I'm going to launch the poll. How would you describe your business? What bucket do you fall into? <clears throat> are you food service, catering, vending? Are you a restaurant looking to extend the reach of your products elsewhere? A retailer, grocery? Or do you not fit into any of these buckets? Do, 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 two seconds left. Okay. So um, a number of, of, of folks from soup food service, a uh, few from vending and then uh, grocery as well. Fantastic. Okay, we will try to cater uh, the discussion to your, your requisite areas. Now, next, I'm interested in, are you a current Byte Technology client? So are you already using the platform today? Or are you kind of in the final stages of looking to move forward with Byte and really wanting to look at, at a preview of what it looks like to operate this at scale? Um, again, this is gonna help us cater the questions we ask and then the content we cover. And it looks like most of you are, are not, oh no, we do have, we have a few Byte technology clients. Excellent, welcome guys. Um, a few that are just curious and wanna learn more. And then uh, a number of you are kind of in the final stages of looking at Byte and planning to move forward soon. And thank you for the typo. That was me frantically putting the poll questions in this morning, not planning to move forward soon, planning. <clears throat> Forgive me. Okay, thank you guys. Um, let me end the poll and let's continue. 
Okay, so product selection. Elise, take it away. How do we think about product selection? So when you're looking at the entire store, kind of you're looking at the menu that you're going to be offering to your customer base. Because our stores are transportable, you're going to be moving them into locations where the consumer is going to be different in each location. So you really have to try to figure out what is that menu going to look like for each location specifically. Um, if you're just going to have a mix for every store, if you're going to have a mix per store to kind of build that margin, grow and grow, grow it over time. So here are a few five ways to look at your product mix and kind of decide if a product is a good fit or not. So you're looking at the margin. What is the actual food cost of the store? You're looking at the look and feel of the store, making sure you have a good mix, similar to a grocery store experience. Looking at your rotation and variety. Are you going to have flavors change over time? Are you not? Are you going to have seasonal flavors? Um, and then looking at the day parts. What parts of the day are highest gross, uh, less sales, higher sales? And then just the latest food trends, right? You're looking at building out your menu specifically for your store for your brand per location mm -hmm. and so kind of going into each one of these with your lens of your brand to decide okay so for products am i going to have fr fresh food am i going to have more shelf stable am i going to have snacks am i going to have meals am i going to have a mixture and am, how am i going to rotate this you don't want to have 10 different kinds of salad right off the bat and then trying to decide what sells and what doesn't you might want to rotate them every other week to have two or three options so the customer never gets bored so kind of looking at those that through that lens to decide that product mix and we'll go through each one individually here so the first thing we kind of look at is just the typical buying behavior in a workplace right now most people buy between breakfast and lunch when they first get into the office before they sit down at their desk between that first morning meeting or even at lunchtime and then that late afternoon lunch where that person maybe had meetings all day until one or two and they need to have a late lunch but it's too late to go out it's too late in the day so they just need to grab something so you're looking at the parts of the day where the customer is searching for that food so that way you can make sure you meet your product mix meets that requirement and then encourages them to buy from your store. Mm -hmm. And one thing we saw at when we were operating the service is that while there did did need or it benefited us to have an ongoing rotation and not a high amount of rotation, but a, a rotation of new offerings for to cater the, to those that are buying lunch, breakfast could really remain consistent. People could eat that same oatmeal or that breakfast sandwich or that yogurt or hard boiled eggs over and over and over. And they wanted to be able to expect that same offering every, every day they want to buy. But for lunch, that variety was needed. And then what time of day do consumers snack, right? The snack times, because you want them to come back more than one or two times in a day, right? You want them to buy breakfast, buy a snack or buy lunch or buy two to three times in a day. So just analyzing kind of what the consumer does. And so just this basic poll, like a lot of people snack within that afternoon, early evening as a majority. And then that morning snack and late night snack are a little bit of a lower end. So you're kind of looking at what, type of items can I flex as a snack as well as a meal so people can buy multiple of. And so here are just some items that you can flex between that mini meal and snack. So hard boiled eggs was a really huge top seller here in the Bay Area. Jerky, protein bars, nuts, cheese, kind of think of these as added on items. So if a, somebody comes and purchases breakfast and lunch, they're satisfied, they're full, but they're still going to want to snack on something throughout their day. So what are those added items to increase that ticket price that maybe they add on in addition to their lunch at that time of purchase? or coming back a second or third time because they saw that hummus dippers in there. They have it in their mind from lunchtime. It's now 3.30, getting that afternoon slump. Can I go back and buy another item? So you're increasing that transaction purchase and you're increasing those sales just by adding a variety of options. And some of these items too, you can think about as an add-on to their meal. So if somebody buys a salad, but they're counting macros that day and they need to have higher protein, they can add on a hard boiled egg or even a side protein of chicken. So where your, your sale price of the salad is $10.99, but you're adding on that three or $4 to that ticket price just by adding on that extra protein to that meal. 
And it also looks really nice in a store, right? If you're looking at a grocery store and you're looking at the salad section, you see all the variety of colors and the different sizing of packaging. Kind of think of that when your customer's looking at the store. If they see snacks on every shelf, they see meals on every shelf, they see drinks on every shelf and it's all mixed matched and it's colorful and it's very appealing to the eye. It makes them go to the store without even being hungry most of the time. And then they decide, okay, wait, I, I could use some cheese right now just to snack on right now. And it just becomes essentially a game to some people of like, what's in there today? Let's go look at it and kind of makes it fun and inviting to have people continuously come back. So you have those guaranteed sales on a daily basis to those engaged audience that's already there. Um, one thing to really consider too is food trends, right? Everybody talks about it throughout the work day. Oh, what's the latest diet phase today? What's the latest thing that's really healthy for us? Especially after going through a pandemic and everyone gaining the COVID-19 weight and just really wanting to look to lose the weight or just looking at food in a very different lens. Um, so just kind of think about the vegetarian options, the vegan options, um, sustainability, your packaging, um, having healthy options and accommodate, accommodating that dietary restrictions because a lot of people were cooking for themselves. So they're starting to realize what makes them feel good, what doesn't make them feel good. So they're looking at those ingredients a little bit closer now, but they're also looking at options that are healthy that they can eat without them making it. Because let's all be real, everyone is tired of making their own food at this point. So more and more people are buying meals out. So if you're able to provide those healthier options where they're still lower in calorie than a restaurant meal or fast food, you're going to appeal to that market that usually would have brought their meals to work or brought their meals with them. Now they're going to want to seek out other places and you can fill that need. And this is really a way to get your diehard customers is, is what I've seen is um, the beauty of Bites platform is that you are able to provide all the details on the nutritionals, the ingredients and all of those kind of allergen filters. And we worked with Google to actually create those allergen filters. So to some, they may be complete overkill, you know, mollusk free, who, who needs to know that? But, but, but for those people who are operating with these dietary needs, when they see they can filter the menu by these criteria and that becomes like a go-to place, they will come again and again and again because there's not that many places where you can go to see what is gluten-free or what is dairy-free. Um, so this could be a really an easy win for you. And a really great feature too of the dashboard is that you can have an online menu. So mm -hmm. we have URLs for every single store that are stagnant. You can create QR codes, put them on the store. You can email market them to show people what's in the store. It will only show them the inventory of what's currently there. It'll even tell you how many are left just in case you're that diehard that needs your hard boiled egg and there's only two left. You better get to go into the store before they run out. And you'll be able to see all of those allergens all on the website without even visiting the store. So you know that this chicken salad is compliant with everything you're looking for. And there's three available in the store. So now I can go over there and purchase without being in front of it. So it's a really great tool that we have. One thing to always, always do is to survey the employees or the market that you're going to. So if you're putting this into an office or you're putting into an apartment building or you're putting it into a wing of a hospital, get food preferences from the people that are there. What other options do people go to in the area? Do they go to Cadobo? Do they go to Chipotle? Do they go to Sweet Greens? Kind of what are those options? What are people looking for? Are they looking for salads, meals? Do they want vegetarian? Do they want vegan? Asking those preferences and the best thing to hear is you can ask for their email in exchange for a coupon. So if they complete your online Google form, you get an email address, you can be able to email blast them a coupon for their first purchase. And then you can also see that kind of retention rate of like, what is that return? How many people from this Google form use their coupon? So if I made a hundred coupons and I dispersed them, I can see that only 35 have been used. And so then you can even have personal marketing going to those 35 people and show that, oh, you really enjoyed this chicken salad. We just came out with a brand new chicken one. Here's a picture of it and here's the ingredients. And just constantly having that interaction with the, in the guests that are there that are going to be purchasing just hits you off from the day one to have strong sales and continuous sales. And then have that continuous feedback, right? To be able to know what they're wanting, what they don't like, what they do love. And it helps you make those educated decisions to switch up your product mix for higher sales. 
Yes, this is a must do before you launch survey the employees. It's a it's low hanging fruit. I'm going to stop sharing really quick because we had a few questions come in. Um, <clears throat> the oh, someone asked where the data comes from that that meal consumption distribution. Um, that's from the platform. So basically, we looked across the entire fleet of over a thousand kiosks, focusing in on workplaces, um, and that was. That's the distribution. And that's a cl classic distribution for people who are in the office. You get the long tails for those who have a graveyard shift. Um, but most people, like Elise said, breakfast and lunch. <clears throat> um, let's say there was more breakfast options than lunch options. That could inflate the breakfast portion of usage. It, it could, but typically when you're going into, again, that, that data set was for workplaces. The goal is to create that well-rounded set where regardless of it's breakfast, lunch, heck, even dinner, there's something there for you. So we're talking about sandwiches and salads, um, breakfast parfaits, breakfast burritos, uh, heatable entrees, and then those in between, right? There's a you know wealth of drinks, snacks, um, but for that purchase distribution as to when people are coming to the fridge, it's, it's between that kind of those well, the peak is at 12 p.m. at noon, um, but also breakfast to noon is, is kind of a peak peak period. So any other questions, guys? We do have one here that talks about what's the best way to encourage engagement and start surveying customers. Mm. So when you're going into a location, if a location's saying yes, they're excited about what you offer. Um, they want to see it be successful too. Because if they're employees or they're the people at that site, you know, we're really talking about sites that have a recurrent um, population of people that are going to be there consistently. This doesn't really apply if it's, you know, at an airport or in a more public location. But certainly if you're in a hospital with employees, a university with students, a workplace with employees, they're excited that you're there. So leverage that excitement and either um, we've done that, we've seen this done two ways is you can actually provide the materials for them to send out or post, um, you know, physically post on a wall or in the bathrooms or public areas. Or if they're willing to share the email addresses with you, you can send the email blast out. And that's where you can incentivize people to fill out a survey in order to get the coupon. So they complete the survey, you have their email, you can then take that email, create a coupon through Byte's platform and send them a coupon. Um, and you can do it very quickly with a large volume of people using tools like uh, mail merge, for instance. Um, all right, let's jump back in. All right, so merchandising. Once you have what your product selection and you you know thought through a well-rounded set, then it becomes about okay, how do I how do I actually set it up in the store so it's it's visually beautiful. Um, typically before you launch the store, it's nice to just mock things up, you know, get your product set, put it on the shelves, take some pictures, um, and, and come up with your initial planogram, essentially planogram being this product goes here. Um, this product goes there. When we were operating the service, um, we had, you know, well over a hundred SKUs. So it was a pretty high SKU count that we were operating with. And, um, instead of having a slot per SKU, we actually had zones. So um, this allowed us to stock within a single slot, a chicken Caesar salad, and then a Greek salad, and then a spring mix salad, all within a single row so that the consumers would get a high level of variety, but we didn't have you know, a facing per SKU. And we were able to do that by creating zones. We had our drinks down the middle, we had you know, salads on the second shelf. We would have breakfast items on the top shelf, um, sandwiches, wraps, heatable entrees on the third shelf. And on the bottom shelf, we did kind of more snackable items. And that was how we educated anyone who was going out to restock the kiosk because they need to know what that planogram is. Having those zones allowed them to you know, very quickly and intelligently restock those fridges. Of course, you want it to look beautiful. Um, Ideally, you have your top sellers or big margin drivers at eye level because that's where you you know you walk up and that's where you're initially drawn to. Um, obviously, thinking about the day parts, you know, if people are shopping there in that morning to lunchtime rush, you're, you want to make sure those are more prevalent. 
And then encouraging product pairing. So there's a reason we had drinks go up the middle because we wanted somebody to take a kombucha and a salad and be on their way. <clears throat> um, the other piece that I wanted to mention is that the, in terms of stocking consistency by our stockers, I just want to touch on the restocking process here because it is, I don't think there's another solution to market with a restocking process as easy as bites. Um, to restock, uh, 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 you're basically entering a username and a password to unlock the fridge in restocker mode. And then at that point, you're simply removing any expired product. You're adding the product that you want to add. You close the door and that's it. So the beauty is that the technology, the kiosk is automatically picking up every single item that was just removed and every single item that was just added. And that means you have reporting on the back end showing what's spoiled and what was taken out of the fridge as unsold, as well as what was included in a restock. Um, restocking really should take no more than five to seven minutes, depending on the volume of product that's being added and removed. Um, okay, so that's merchandising. We got a great question real quick about merchandising, about how many products can you fit currently in the fridge? Oh, that's a good question. And it really depends. Um, it depends on the form factor of the products, but you can see in kind of these standard salads, these are going six back um, or five back. It really depends how much you want to cram in there. Uh, if it's more of like a can, I believe it's like six or seven back. Um, but if you'd like the dimensions of the, the shelves uh, in the fridge itself, we've got a, a pretty thorough spec sheet so that you can actually calculate out what will fit in the fridge. Typical uh, retail, again, if the fridge is stocked with a rounded set of products with salads, et cetera, we saw the retail kind of price of a fully stocked fridge be in that $600 to $700 range. Um, but it, again, that, that's obviously dependent on, on the price point of your products. And that, and that I want to say, was like 120 items. And then what do you do with the spoiled and unsold food? Oh, I love that question. Find a food rescue. Find a local food rescue. That product that you're pulling, it's probably just reaching its best by date, which means it's still good. And that is, that is product that is, can still be eaten. And most importantly, it's ready to eat. It doesn't have to be prepped um, and cooked. And so food rescue organizations, this is like the gold of, of donations. So what, what Bite did was we actually partnered with several food rescue organizations around the Bay Area. And at the end of the route, the drivers would either drop directly off at that, at that organization or that food rescue organization would actually come to, we were operating out of a warehouse, so they would come to the warehouse and actually pick that product up. But I, uh, I highly encourage you to find a food rescue organization. And that can be part of your, you know, your pitch to your locations is the fact that this food isn't wasted. It's actually supporting a community in need as well. Okay, so let's dive into routing. So this may not apply to everybody, but for anyone who is operating kiosks at multiple locations, um, you, you wanna think about how you are routing those and going out to actually make those deliveries. Um, here's what we found. Um, and some of this will apply, you know, if you're um, operating a cafe and stocking fridges within a campus, you, you want to think about when the fridge is the time the fridge is stocked anyways. Ideally, you, um, you want to stock that fridge before people are going to be there shopping on a regular basis. So in a workplace after hours, right? You want people coming in on Monday morning to a fully stocked, beautiful fridge. Stocking after hours also benefits you from, um, from a routing and delivery perspective because there's just less people on the road. There's less people in the building. Um, we always encourage to do it after hours if you can. Um, know your target food sales per drop. So for every delivery you make, how much in sales do you want that to drive essentially? Um, and, and sometimes, I mean, certainly for us when we were operating, we didn't know this off the bat. It was more, let's look at the data, let's see how different stores are performing. Um, at different delivery volumes and then get a sense of what that target food sales per drop is. 
of course, there's shelf life considerations. If you if your products have a two day shelf life, you can't deliver once a week. You're going to need to deliver it, you know, at least three times a week. Um, if you are as you are, you know, getting to a high number of kiosks in the field, we found that centralizing the picking of products for delivery is the is the best route. So what I mean by that is. The beauty of Byte is that you know in real time what the inventory is. You have the ability to input the PAR level, you know, what should be stocked. And based on that, you know what needs to be picked and delivered to that kiosk. Do that centrally. Don't go out with like a big volume of products and then at the kiosk, go back to and, and grab what you need based on what's in the kiosk. Use the software, pick at a central location, and then make those deliveries. And then um, again, as you grow, the more locations that you can deliver to on a single route, and the closer they are, you know that's that's just going to maximize your your margins. Um, there's a number of tools out there. Uh, there are free tools like Google Maps. That's what we used up until I think we got. After 25, they prohibit you from adding more destinations, but start with Google Maps. It's, it's a great tool. Um, there's a lot of considerations in terms of the, the tool that you use. Um, as we were operating at scale, we were actually using Optimal Route, really inexpensive solution. I think it was like a couple hundred bucks per month when we were operating 500 plus kiosks. It's a steal. Um, but the choice around what tool you want to use is really going to depend on how many deliveries you're doing. Um, do you want real time tracking, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. I won't go into a lot of detail here. But no, if you are making this decision, we're happy to provide our thoughts and, and help you think through this. We have a great question about how do you access locations after hours? Any way to convince businesses to let you do it? Right now, people we talk to don't want us to come in when no one's in the office. At least you know this inside and out because you were doing the exact same thing. So you take that one. Completely. It is, it is definitely a conversation to have with the client. Um, you always want to kind of see their expectations of what they expect to have for food because most clients would rather you come in at night rather than you coming during the day and disrupting the work day for their employees or staff. So depending on the company, they might just have you do a background check on that driver to where they can have a background check on them on file as if they were an employee. They check out a key to you so they know which employee is getting that key. Um, they might do monthly check-ins to see to make sure the logs are good. So just have that conversation with them about what their expectations are to have the food available to them. Because it really does help drive the need of like, I do need to come in at nighttime to make sure when your people come in at 7 a.m. in the morning, they come into a fully stocked fridge. So just having a that conversation with them of what their process is to have outside vendors come in. Is it a background check? Is it a contract? Is it kind of those type of things? Um, usually facilities management will know that answer. So if your client does, just kind of have them ask facilities to see what would be necessary to take that. Yeah. And if you don't, I mean, the first time you ask and you don't get a win, that's fine. Revisit it in three months once you've established a certain level of trust. <clears throat> um, Empower your restockers. These are the people that are on site delivering to the kiosk. If they're delivering during hours where consumers are there, they're going to get feedback. So really making sure that they're well trained in terms of just best practices. You know, knowing what pull date of product they need to remove, making sure they have very clear understanding of what the merchandising guide guidelines are, and then and I mean they're an extension of 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 your brand um, and of your company, obviously. So making sure that you're engaging them and getting feedback. I, I think this was just talking with our delivery drivers on a regular basis was um, some of the most helpful information we got in terms of what locations did and did not like. <clears throat> Technology does a lot. Yes, and bite surfaces feedback from customers and whatnot, but oftentimes just talking with people is really fantastic. Okay, lastly, financial optimization. Um, once you are live, right, I think there's some front end financial optimization to do, certainly, and that is first and foremost to understand what you expect your unit economics to look like. 
Um, this is just go going in, Byte provides a calculator that we're happy to walk through with you, um, but basically breaking down your revenues. So what are your expected food sales at a location? Are you gonna charge for the service? That's what the subscription piece is, to know what, what your total revenue will be. And then breaking down your costs. So for the, the food that you're selling, what, is your, what are your food costs? Um, what do you expect your spoilage to look like? Um, depending on your food costs, spoilage we see anywhere from five to 15% typically. Um, then there is the cost to deliver. If you're operating a cafe and the, the, you know, the kiosk is down the hall, this goes to zero essentially. Um, and then of course, there's any costs associated with using Byte solutions. So you wanna go in with an, a, a sense of what your profitability should look like. And then, and then that can act as a benchmark once you're actually looking the, at the financial results. Um, garbage in equals garbage out when it comes to financial analysis. I'll give you a, sense, a second to read this comment because I find it hilarious. There's two areas in the Byte dashboard where you want to make sure to enter appropriate data. On the revenue side, under the stores section of the dashboard, you want to be sure you are inputting at a minimum the subscription information. So is that is that location paying you to provide that service? Which we see number of Byte's clients, that is the case. And then under costs, when you're adding products, make sure you enter your food costs. Um, that's the single biggest uh, miss that I see is that people add products, but they're not adding the food costs. They're just adding the retail price. And without that, it's, it's really hard for, um, to provide a nice roll up of profitability. Elise, I think these were your slides and I just jumped right in. Carry on. And you did, you did very good. Um, you. We've, I, we've, we've done these financials like the back of our hand at this point. <laughs> I strongly encourage every new client within your first month of launching your store to really review your financials. Look at the data. Our dashboard gives you the most in amount, the biggest amount of data set that I have seen on any food service platform. It really gives you all the information you need to make educated decisions to increase that revenue. So you're wanting to look at that. What does that economics look like? What are your food costs look like right now? Is it or is your spoilage really high? What's selling? What are your top selling products? What are your non top selling products? What isn't selling at all? Kind of looking at every single layer to it to make sure you drive that sales higher and that spoilage lower. Because that's really where you're going to make the most revenue. If you constantly sell the higher priced items or you're constantly spoiling them, that could make a big difference in that margin percentage. So just always just doing a simple transaction export in the dashboard. It takes less than one minute to download the report. And then just really reading the data and seeing how many customers are coming. What is that subscription you're getting? What is that list price of sales that are being made? How much in subsidized discounts are being made? Because if the company is paying for a discount, that's also additional revenue to you. Looking at your spoilage total, the spoilage percentage, and really looking at this on a per store basis, right? Because if you're managing one to three stores as it is, if one store is doing really poor, but the other two are doing well, your margin is still not as great as it could be. So it's really looking at that store that's not performing and making adjustments that make sense. So some things like that, that or adjustments that you could look at to make is reducing your spoilage for that margin, right? So you're seeing your spoilage for this store is $607, but your credit card sales are only at $400 to $800 and your spoilage needs to go way down. So really looking at the products that are selling, you know that your salads and sandwiches are, but maybe your breakfast items are not selling at this location. So let's take those items out of rotation and increase the amount of products that are selling. So putting more salads on the store and taking out those breakfast items. And then looking at it again a month later, did that help my spoilage? Did that reduce the spoilage? And then you can see that growth over time. Another thing is to increase the subscription cost. This is a question I get a lot from a lot of new clients of, wait, I can charge a service fee for this? I always kind of think about it as a catering, right? When you hire catering to come into a location, you're paying a delivery fee for them to come and deliver the food. 
you're paying a setup fee for them to set up your chargers and your chafing dishes and all of that fun stuff. Then you're charging for the cost of the food itself. So think of all those service line items you're paying for catering. With, our, with the food vending in a bite store, it's essentially a service. You're still coming to the store two to three times a week to deliver. That's a cost to deliver the food. You're having the constant food be there available without the company paying for it. That's a service. So even if you're just asking a client to pay $125 or $150 a month, that can offset just your monthly licensing fee or your delivery costs altogether just by having that subscription cost. And even if you have a store in a location, it is never too late to ask for a service fee because you have to look at your economics, right? You have to have that open conversation. Another thing is to optimize your food sales per delivery. So maybe your food sales are a little bit higher than um, at some locations and lower at others. So maybe the lower locations with lower sales, you visit them now only once or twice a week. But the locations that you're selling more, you visit three to four times a week. So that way you're increasing the amount of food on shelf. And so it increases the sales, right? You're increasing that revenue coming in per delivery. So really looking at your delivery count. And then lastly, looking for opportunity for more sales. Is this location going through five, $6,000 of food a month? Maybe they need to have a second store in that location, or maybe they need to have um, more deliveries. They need to have twice a day deliveries, maybe if there's just a constant influx of product being sold off the shelf. So just really looking at all these different metrics and how can you turn that dial up to increase that revenue? Mm -hmm. And a question that came in that was actually really interesting that goes with this is picking your pars for picking and your pick list and your stocking. So in the Byte dashboard on every store, there is a restock page that allows you to see what are the last 30 days of sales, the last 30 days of unsold food, and then how much of that percentage of time was it stocked out? So how many times was that product not in stock when a customer went to swipe and purchase? So you're really able to look and see what are those sales, and then you can create PARs based on that data without even having to export the information. You can set your PARs and then print a pick list straight from there without having to do any more information. Mm -hmm. And that pick list will always be available. So Monday, you need to you know, print the pick list. It's going to look at the inventory at that moment in time. It's going to look at the PARs that you set, and it's going to say, here's what needs to be packed. <clears throat> so setting up PARs, maybe you revisit those once a month to make sure they're at the right levels. Um, but really, it's... Um, kind of leveraging that for the ongoing pick that you're running? It's a great question. Okay, I am curious, although we don't have a whole lot of clients on this call, but I'm curious to ask you guys, what have you seen to be the most effective tactics for boosting gross margin? Is it you know just starting off with a good location first and foremost? Is it getting really smart about how you discount products so that you're not taking that hit from a spoilage perspective? You know, Byte offers a pretty deep way of discounting products or intelligent, I should say. Um, is it using customer emails to market to them and remind them to come on back? Is it getting locations that actually sponsor subsidies, um, better product selection, or is it just being really smart about routing and restocking? All right, three, two, and one. I'll share the results here. So we've got um, better product selection is a big one. Um, and then coming in behind that, finding a good location for the fridge itself. And that could be the actual location that it's in as in the workplace and the type of workplace, how many people are there, the kind of proximity to other food options, or it could be, I mean, we've seen just moving the kiosk to a different location within that same building can drive like a 10x increase in sales. So there's that as well. And then getting locations to sponsor subsidies. Okay, great. Um, moving right along, let's talk about upselling because I feel like it is the diamond in the rough that almost everybody forgets about. And Elise, you are the queen. Yes, I always, always leave this with saying, if you don't ask, you don't get. So to have the conversation with clients and your locations about these options 
they might not be able to even know that these options are available to them because other food services can't provide these things. So it's just another leverage point of the bite technology that you get to sell and increase that revenue without even making a sale yet. So some things to kind of highlight here are just going to be coupons, subsidies, happy hours, and additional locations and stores. Each one of these has a different client fit, a different location fit. So always come back to where you're aiming for, what location, what client, and let's figure out what's a good fit for this place. So the first one we're going to go through is coupons. Coupons are super, super easy to make in the dashboard. You have two options. You can make a single use coupon where it's once used, it's null and void, can't be used again. Or you can have a reusable coupon where you can create the coupon code and you can um, just disperse it constantly and you can see how many times it's being used. Some really great ways to apply coupons are for new hire perks. So having companies buy coupons from you, say 10, let's just say they buy 10, $10 coupons, that's $100 income to you as additional revenue. And then they disperse that $10 coupon to every new employee in their onboarding packet. So it encourages them from day one to go and buy from the store. Another one is employee recognition. So say a sales team right now in COVID, they have a sales blitz. They need to meet a certain amount of sales calls in a day. Whoever gets the most amount of calls that day gets a coupon for a free lunch for the fridge. And then being able to onboard it and encourage that first purchase. Another great application we're seeing right now is in gyms primarily. So if you've put a bite store in a gym, creating trainer specific coupon codes. So say you have a trainer Kelly and a trainer Tom. You make Kelly 10, Tom 10, just like they do on Instagram, swipe up for my link. Same thing, go and purchase from the store after our training session and you get 10% off or $10 off your first purchase. Because we all know that nutrition and exercise have to go hand in hand to find that weight loss. So trainers are wanting to sell that to go and buy the better food rather than you just going to McDonald's after your training session, because if the customer ain't seeing the results, they're not going to continuously come back to them. So you're that's having that great. salesperson yeah. sell the service for you. Yeah, that's a great example. Subsidies. So subsidies are a thing that people are just, how do I use this? What do I do? Subsidies are essentially a way for you to charge a discount to your location. So our fridges are, you have the ability to set a discount at the store and it will discount automatically on the menu screen for whatever time range you select, whatever products you select, you have every leverage pulley you can imagine for discounts. And then you're allowing that discount to be purchased by your location. One thing that a lot of offices need is proof, right, of whatever funds are going towards. For us, our transaction data shows you every single name of a person that purchased and what discount they received. So you can charge a 25% discount to, let's just say Google, they have their corporate, what their corporate headquarters, you're putting a store there, you put 25% off on the store. At the end of the month, you can give them a report showing every single person that benefited from that 25% discount. And then here's the total of the invoice that they need to pay you. So you're still receiving the full retail list price of your items that are being sold, but the customer is being encouraged to buy it because it's on sale and on discount. And it's encouraging the client to have that constant interaction with the employees because they're paying for that discount. So they're also an added advocate to have increasing sales. Mm -hmm. So you can set this as a control based. So it's a kind of like a happy hour, just like a typical restaurant. You can have it go on Monday, Wednesday, Friday from three to 5 p.m. You can set it to a set percent discount to be on there at all times, but just you can leverage different types of discounts that the clients want to pay for. Happy hours are a great, great discount to be able to do because the store does it itself. It automatically changes the price for you when it starts that time. And when happy hour is over, it automatically changes back. So you can set it and forget it. And a lot of people use this um, for employee recognition. So at the end of the month, the sales team met their goal. We're going to give the whole office 50% 50, 50 off today. You'd be surprised how many times that 50% discount, that store is empty within the same day. So always leverage those discounts and being able to apply it because when a customer sees that red line through that list price and that new price in red, I don't know what it is, but it just makes people want to swipe their card that much faster. 
<laughs> it's amazing. And you get to charge it back to the client. You're not losing out on that sales. And so it's a really great tool to use and look at the, you can look at your monthly transaction data and see what days of the week are your slowest, right? So say your slowest days are Tuesday because after lunchtime, it dies off, nobody buys it but you're going to restock on Wednesday. So you know that food is going to spoil out. You can set a happy hour to be every Tuesday from three to five and get that merchandise out the store. So when you come in on Wednesday to restock, it's empty and you don't have to cover that cost of spoilage. Mm -hmm. More stores. This is a big one because our stores, they are a smaller footprint. So this, you could have a lot of opt times where you sell out a product on a daily basis because the engagement is so high and the revenue is so high. So you can start to see that locations need more stores, where if you're constantly having the client call you saying, I need more stock, the store needs to be restocked on a daily basis. Okay, that's probably an indicator. We should probably put another store in that building. So it allows two points of sale rather than one, because you don't want to also, you want to look at your delivery costs too, right? You don't want to have to continuously deliver twice a day to a location. It might be just better off to put two stores there. Mm -hmm. Okay, another, I think this is our last poll. And I'd love to hear from you guys as to um, what offerings you've been most successful upselling to locations. There's, because the Byte platform allows for so many different iterations of coupon types and discounts, there really is a laundry list of, of what you could go to clients with, but who, what have you guys been most successful with? I think one of the, as you guys are filling this out, one of the um, discount types that, that I really love, and I think is such a, uh, an exciting one in this day and age is the ability to discount by category. So let's say you've got a client who's really conscious of promoting wellness in the workplace, you can work with them to really deeply subsidize um, certain categories of food or even certain SKUs if you wish. And, and that is them putting their money where their mouth is. Um, and it's also just the, you know, the biggest, two biggest drivers to promote healthier eating are convenience and price. And if you, you're delivering convenience through the kiosk, um, and if they're bringing down the price, you can make some pretty big moves there. So uh, on, from the poll perspective, folks have had most success with a monthly subscription for the service and with coupons. Okay, excellent. Um, let's go, oh shoot, do I need to end the poll? I think I did. Do, do. Takeaways, we're 50 minutes in. We've covered a lot of ground. Um, there's really three takeaways that I'd love for everybody to walk away with. Um, first is just thinking about your product selection in terms of day parts. When are people gonna be there shopping from your, from your kiosk? Um, sometimes it doesn't make sense to do it all yourself to create the entire selection, partner where it makes sense. Um, with When we were operating the service ourselves, we, we didn't have the um, benefit of having a kitchen. So we actually partnered across the board. We acquired all of our product on a wholesale basis. Um, if you're operating a kitchen, you have so much more flexibility, which is really fantastic. Second is matching your delivery frequency to your food sales volume. So after that, typically when you first start off with a location, you want to deliver more frequently than not. And then once you've got a month under your belt, look at your food sales, look at when people are buying, and then adjust accordingly. Um, and that's, that's a really quick way to boost margin. And then third is to review those financials on a regular basis. Um, and, and just find the, the, the things that you can tweak to improve your, the overall profitability. Um, we, we like to think really of that first month of data. That's your, okay, now you're ready to get started at that point. Um, that's when you can start pulling, pulling knobs and upselling clients and, and whatnot. Um, really great question actually about the delivery drivers. Mm -hmm. As delivery drivers, drivers, we find it hard to hire ourselves because delivery is only at best two days a week and working with a partner, even though we train them, they sometimes don't have enough motivation to do a good job. And the rest of the week, they don't deliver and stock food that often. And so they don't do it very nicely. Mm, that's a tricky one. Um, that is definitely a tricky one. I think that find ways to incentivize that driver. Have, a, have you know, little performance bonuses. If it's if it's the same driver each time, that is a lot easier because you can offer, you know, Starbucks gift card or an Amazon gift card or or just a cash incentive. 
but but there has to be something in it for that driver to um to do a, a good job for you and and maybe it's beyond that maybe it's really educating them on the social good of your company and the mission of your company and the the value that they're adding to this location to make them feel ownership and a part of what you're doing it's a tricky one you may have to iterate on a, on a few different tactics there um, there's more resources bite is doing a, a lot more of these just ongoing webinars you can always see what's coming up um, on our website under resources webinars uh, anyone who is um, really interested in sinking their teeth in and operating this business, growing it. I encourage you to join an upcoming webinar, uh, Fireside Chat with a few of our clients. Um, one is 6 a.m. Health out of Boston and then Tomei Catering down in Lubbock, Texas. Both have really successfully scaled this business themselves. 6 a.m. Health is really operating as more as a fresh vending company and Tomei Catering is a caterer with a retail store and um, somebody who's very quickly rolling out a lot of kiosks and workplaces and otherwise. So join that. Um, Byte Academy is available to you. Um, you can actually find that on our homepage, just scroll to the bottom and then follow us on social. Any other questions though, before we wrap up? Let me stop sharing. I can't see the Q&A when I'm sharing. Any other questions, guys? Okay, excellent. Well, thank you all for joining. I hope this was useful and uh, hope to be working with, with many of you soon. Have a wonderful Thursday, guys. Bye.